Hello everyone, I'm Dale Schwagel, and thanks for joining us in our discussion today with Dr. Finbar Kaur on his latest book, Broken Promises, Vatican Council II. Dr. Kaur, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you taking your time out to help me get this board out. Now, what inspired you to write this book? Well, uh, I have to admit, I'm a passionate Catholic. Uh, I've been very active in the Catholic Church from, I was age eight. I was an altar boy, served Mass, and that was the highlight of my week. And from that point on, I wanted to be a priest, just like my uncle, Father Michael Corr, who served in the U.S. Army uh, as a chaplain, and uh, distinguished, I should say, as well. And he became my mentor in my younger days as a priest when I came here to the United States. And uh, I received my education in the seminary, compliments of the church. I went back to school and I got my master's at Iona College in pastoral counseling and my doctorate in family life education at Columbia. And I just feel an obligation to give back to the church for all their support to me because I wouldn't be the educated gentleman I think I am or people think I am over all these years. And what ha ha bothered me was that the church has not lived up to its promises it made at the Second Vatican Council. I mean, they basically, John XXIII called all of the bishops and cardinals of the world together to renew the word he used was a giornamento. He said, let's open up the windows and renew the church, meaning that it, he looked upon it as being stuck back in the Middle Ages with rules and regulations that wasn't making much sense to him. And he had the experience of working in foreign countries, so he knew what he was talking about when he called them all together. And b basically, he, uh, when he died prematurely, while the council was just really getting going, unfortunately, the popes that came after him st stopped th this progress. Pope Paul VI took over, making a decision regarding the regulation of birth, whether couples could use contraceptives or not. All of that happened and right after that. So that my disappointment was then is that the bishops did not live up to the commitments they made themselves during those three years, from four years from 1962 or 63 down to 65. And yeah. they gradually let the uh, conservative attitude come back again of secrecy, control, and the bishops making all the decisions, which were not there. And then the biggest problem I had was the cover-up by the bishops themselves. Then when it started, it didn't just start in 1980, that's when it hit the newspapers, but it was going on. I was familiar with it from, from 1951 in Ireland, in the boarding school I attended. So that why the bishops choose to uh, hide it from the civic authorities is one question. Later on, we'll see, we'll talk about how the Apostolic Nuncio sent a word from the Vatican to the bishops, particularly in Ireland, follow canon law, namely church law, but be slow to report priests in this condition to civil authorities. Mm -hmm. Now, one part of the book that I found interesting was that you've actually met two popes, but not necessarily your favorite. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yes, and I went on sabbatical in, to Rome for three months in 1986, and I had the pleasure, which was really a, a big surprise to me, to be invited with nine other priests, but all Irish-born, but they weren't serving in my diocese back in New Jersey. They were for serving in England, Scotland, etc., were all invited to come celebrate Mass with John Paul II in his private chapel. And I went just, I was not excited or nervous about it in the beginning at all. But when I went and saw this man meditating and so focused before he started Mass, and how focused he was in the celebration of Mass, I said, I said, golly, I said, I'm in the presence of a saint. And afterwards, he came up to me and he read all of the priests and gave us each a little memento rosary beads. And he said, where are you from, Father? I was go jokingly going to say to him, 
from Ireland, but I didn't think it would be fair to mess up the poor, poor Holy Father. So I said, Paddis the Diocese, New Jersey, Holy Father. And he said, is that near Boston? And you may remember that he was in Boston two years before that and had a great time. So, but basically, what the one that I felt when I did all my research on all the Pope, the one that hit the headlines was John the 23rd. Like me, he was born relatively poor. He has a peasant family. He walked to school in his bare feet three miles each way, which I did in the summertime, walked the kids to school. And he was a very gifted man from the very beginning. His father was recognized that he had talent and saw that he got into a special Catholic school in Bergamo in, in Italy. And from there he just took off. He went great in Latin. And he had something which I have always advocated as a priest, that young people should have a mentor. And he had wonderful mentors. It was a, uh, Bishop Desky took him over as a young priest mm -hmm. and helped develop his skills. And then he, later on, the Holy Father at the time, Pope Pius the Fifteenth, uh, Pope Benedict the Fifteenth, recognized his talent and called him to work in the Vatican. And in a short time, he was sent throughout the world then as a uh, apostolic nuncio to Bulgaria first, later to Greece, later to Athens, and then later on, on to uh, different countries. But in each place he went, he never lost the, uh, his vocation, which was to be a servant priest. He wasn't impressed with all the regalia that goes with being Archbishop or Cardinal. He just was the priest of the people. As a matter of fact, when he was in, introduced uh, at the Basilica in um, Venice, when he became um, the nuncio there, he just said that he was basically, he came from a poor family. We were poor but happy. We did not realize we lacked anything. In truth, we didn't. I was a dignified, happy poverty. I bet you never heard of that description. Nothing like that before. Nothing before. And he lived up to that. So he, lived, he went on from there then to all the different places. So when he became um, eligible to be pope, he never thought he was going to make it. Some popes were accused of campaigning to be for pope. He certainly didn't, because even when he left Venice to go to the conclave, which is called the title given the place where they elect the pope, he and his assistant, the Monsignor, uh, had returned tickets. And at the station, he said to the station master, he said, I have something to tell you, but you're going to have to wait for 10 days till I get back. And the station master said to him, you're not, I, my hope is you won't be coming back. And he finally hit him that he's thinking I'm going to be pope. That's ridiculous. But he was elected pope because they felt that, first of all, there's nobody mature enough at that particular point at the age to become, but he had the, the leadership, the care, he also cared for priests, and he, and he knew, had such a worldwide experience. So they thought he would be a good stopgap pope for five or four or five years until a new pope would, would come and be ready. Now, Dr. Cora, apparently there are two themes to your book, and obviously two things that disappoint you um, about the church today. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, yep, like I said, I was a ordained prior to the Second Vatican Council. So I was excited about the fact all the changes were coming, like English, from Latin to English, lay people were going to participate in it. So I was excited about all the promises that was going to happen. And I felt probably women would take a bigger role in the church. Maybe one day be ordained priest. And maybe the op celibacy would become optional. All those things would happen. And I also felt that Part of that was the promise of Vatican II was so strong and so uh, meaningful for progressive Catholic my, myself. It was an important part to me. But then, as you know, in, starting in the 1980s, although it wasn't begun then, it started many, many years before that, bishops started uh, hiding pedophile priests rather than reported them civil authorities, they switched them from parish to parish, or in some cases from country to country. And that was a very, very serious disappointment to me. 
And I feel, as a Catholic, former Catholic priest, who got all of his education, my leadership skills, my people skills, and whatever gifts, those gifts from God, I feel an obligation to join those people who want to reform the church and bring back the spirit of Vatican Council too. Because if we don't, we're going to slip back into the pre-Vatican attitude of secrecy, uh, monarchical, hierarchical society, the emphasis on the magisterium, the whole thing, rather than thinking of the church as the people of God, participating with the bishop and leading the church. Let me ask you, with the focus recently been on pedophilia in the church, do you feel like they're making strides at this time to clean it up? There are in, in, in many dioceses, but not all of them. The one particular one that I would say yes to is that in the Archbishop of Dublin, uh, Bishop uh, uh, Diarmuid Martin. He was the first bishop that took all of the records on the pedophile priest in his files in the archdiocese and gave them over to civil authorities. Now, if I ask you to summarize your book into three sentences. Could you do that for me? Well, that's, that's, that's quite a problem when you put that to an Irishman who usually were accused of being long-winded. But let me try it. I, I was going to say the first one would be is uh, whatever happened to Vatican Council II, why was, it, why was it lost? What was the cause of this failure? Why did it stop? It was a great thing that happened to the church. The second thing I would say is, the theme would be, the failure of the, the bishops to live up to their commitment to transparency and judgment. Why did they choose to protect the good name of the church rather than protect the lives of innocent children? Why did they hide the priests and just transfer them parish to parish? The third theme then is a more uh, positive one. Where do we go from here? There are enough progressive groups throughout the world who want reform, both in Ireland, the United States, and I did find right recently in Australia, uh, in, in, uh, in South Africa, Australia, Austria. If they all join together and demand a recall, and get back the spirit of Vatican Council II, call for Vatican, I call it Vatican Council III. Have, have the hierarchy call it what they want. But we need to reform the church because if we keep going backwards, as it seems to be now recently, we had a return almost to Latin masses and more of an emphasis on secrecy and control, it's not going to work. Because in modern times, as you know, your, your own son is finishing college. People are more educated today, so they're not, they're not going to be, to be dictated to by the hierarchy they did in the past. They want to participate as their... Vatican Council allowed them or gave them the green light to become the people of God, participate with the bishop and the pope in saying the, ch the church. And then also, like we said earlier, have a, a say in who is going to be their, their bishop, who is going to be their pastor. That should not be all come from the top down in, in an educated community that we're living in today. I agree. And it leads me to a question as I sit here and talk to you. Let's say there was a Vatican Council III. And let's say they made some changes, such as allowing priests to be married, um, made great strides with the pedophilia. Would you consider returning to the church? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still a member of the church, you know, and I'm still active, in fact, uh, in... In a more official capacity. And if I, would, I would just simply say, what mass am I saying next Sunday? I that, love it. Yeah. I, I, I don't feel left the church. I just... I feel my priest is on hold. Very good. And yeah. that's what I wanted to hear. I wanted yeah, to know yeah, exactly yeah, that. Yeah. Very mm. good. Now, what would you like the average reader to take from your book? Well, I want them, first of all, to try to, to read the book objectively. I try to write it objectively with giving equal time to conservatives and progressive, which I call neo-Catholics, in the book. I'd like them not to just get angry at the bishops. The bishops are like you and I. They're sin, they make mistakes, just like I make mistakes. Look at them with more with empathy, and rather than uh, think of a revolution and a schism for the Catholic Church, think of ways in which they can join reform groups and meet with the bishops and say, 
listen, what happened to Vatican Council II? Was that, it, it may not be infallible or whatever, but this was the mind of the church at the time and the mind of the, of the Holy Spirit guiding us. What's wrong with that? Can we get back to that again and continue the reform that Pope John the Twenty Third initiated? Would you like the hierarchy of the church to read your book? And if they did so and were to call you with uh, some kind of negative point to the book, what would you have to say to them? I would. Uh, I'm not saying all of them will, but I expect that some of them will. In fact, I'm, I'm planning on selling a copy of it to a, a bishop that I'm friendly with, a retired bishop, just to get his feedback and feel on it. But if, if one of the bishops called me and started to criticize me or, you know, try to blow me away or whatever, I would not get angry back. I would just simply say, Your Highness, Your, Your Holiness, or Your, Your Excellency, let's talk about it. Uh, I empathize with you because you'd, I'm not saying that you um, hid pedophile priests, but whether you did or not, it was a mistake. And we need to look at the church, what it, where it was in 1965, when we finished the council. What happened to all those changes and dictates of the council? How about the transparency? Isn't there a way in which we could do that? And I would take an empathetic stand and I would I would be prepared to sit down with bishops and discuss this with them. What happened during Vatican Council II that you would say invigorated the Catholic Church and started progressive thinkers like yourself at least to think that there was hope? Well, there was a radical change from um, particularly in the liturgy, the Mass, on Sunday. I mean, traditionally, when I, I said my first Mass, it was in Latin. My back was to the people. I didn't preach. Now, today, if I had my first Mass, I would be facing the people. I'd be standing in English. There would be choirs participating. There would be lay, there would be girls on the altar serving Mass along with altar boys. There would be lay women doing the readings. There would be a whole different ceremony. You know, and the same thing would happen too. It would be as there would be appointment of bishops would not be just done, done in Rome, but that the local committee of lay people with the priests would decide with the, the bishops who they'd like to have as a bishop. But the same thing here. If someone's coming as a pastor, I think the parish council should be in, should be able to interv interview just like you interview me today and say, what are your goals? How would you lead the parish? What role are lay people, lay women going to have in the church, in the parish with you? So there should be all of that to be, would be, could possibly happen, and I hope it will happen and come back again. And there are actually other denominations of churches that do that, that actually yes. vet their ministers. Yes. Yeah, I remember that because when I started working with a dialogue group in uh, Morristown, New Jersey, as a young priest, there was, was a Baptist uh, congregation, just like you say you remember of, and he, he told me that basically the, the congregation appoints a pastor, you know, and that if they're dissatisfied with him, they have a meeting with him, and they're, they're free to fire him. Now, I'm not saying we should necessarily go that far, but at least we should have a say in what kind of a priest they'd like to have to lead the, the community. You have written very favorably about Cardinal Bernardin in your book. Why is he so special? Well, he's a special bishop to me because e even though I never met him personally, uh, I like the, the attitude. He had a post Vatican II attitude. That's how I would describe it. When he addressed people as bishop, he, he didn't use an authoritative model like, I'm the bishop, I'm telling you what's right and wrong. He came across as a servant uh, priest. and the, and I was very happy to see that they um, elected him chairman of the United States Bishops Conference. And during the time he was there, he made a big effort to bring the, the bishops forward with the Vatican II concept. He told them, he said, our role he said, is to do as Jesus did, basically put an emphasis on social justice, particularly, to the, take care of the poor, educate people in, in, the, in the things about the gospel, save, learn how to save people, and not to be overemphasizing all the, the negative things about abortion and birth control, etc. Now, of course, he was popular with people like me and the 
progressive Catholics, but some of the conservative bishops didn't like him. And some of them attacked him back and said that he, he wasn't respect the magisterium. But the fact is this, is that he was, in following the dictates of the Second Vatican Council, he was basically reading the signs of the times and integrating that in the scriptures. Because, as I said to you earlier, Pope John the Twenty-Third, when he started the council, said, let's open up the windows and leave some fresh air, meaning let's see what's happening in the world today. Because, you know, people are living longer, so it's obvious there are going to be more divorces, there are going to be more people. People can't have 10 ch or 14 children like they had 20 years ago. So many people will have to use some form of birth control, etc. And Bernadine was all of that. He ordered the church to follow also the consistent ethic of life, what he said. If you're going to be pro-life, which is fine, and then protect the, the baby in the womb, then you should protect the people going to war. If war has to happen, it has to be absolutely necessary, but we should work for peace. If we're going to work in terms of family life, then we should give couples the, the tools how to make it a happy marriage and, and to live by the marriage vows, to be positive. And for all of that, unfortunately, uh, he died relatively young. He had cancer. But before he died, he, he wrote in the whole paper in terms of his final um, epitaph that he wanted the bishops to do. And even with that, even though he was dying, one of the cardinals that remain, his name unmentionable right now because he's enough trouble <laughs> with his, his own dice up in Boston. They, they didn't, uh, wouldn't let him through. They just criticized him even while he was dying. Interesting. Yeah. He sounds li like a very progressive very, man Very, he was progressive, church. yeah. And he was reading the size of the time and he was following through on, on, on what people were looking for, you know. Now, there have been several books written on Vatican Council, too. What makes your book so special? Well, <coughs> it's actually it's different because, first of all, I was a priest before, during, and after the Vatican Council. I was in the priesthood for 28 years. It started off three years before it, it was, was called into being. And then, uh, secondly, uh, I had the insight of also being a counselor therapist and worked sometimes with, with um, uh, families who had pedophilia problems in the, in the case, like grandfathers who did their ch affect their children, etc. And plus the fact as well, um, to at least two bishops, I was a consultant. And I felt comfortable enough with one of our own bishops to take him out to lunch in, in 1980 and advise him that this was happening, you know. Now, I had no control over it except just to simply say, this is happening, and to me it's a crime. It's not just a sin, it's a crime. But unfortunately, he didn't take the tip because he continued to hide some of the pedophile priests in that diocese at the time. What do you think the people of God need to do to save the Catholic Church? That's a big question. That's a really big one. It, well, if, I think that... First of all, there are enough people, to, lay people in the educated lay Catholics today, who realize that the church changed, whether the, the hierarchy admits this or not. The church changed because no longer is the bishop, or the pope, and the bishops totally in control. There's a, a, a decree called hum, Humani Generis, in which the popes and the bishops at the council themselves. They defined the church as the people of God, the people of God being the pope, the bishops, the priests, and the laity. And technically speaking, um, lay people should be involved in that process. For example, if they were following it today, and if I was a bishop in a local diocese here, I would ask the people to interview the possible pastors coming in so that I would say in the pastors coming in, Leaders in, lay leaders in the diocese should have a say who the bishop is going to be appointed because he's, he's going to lead them. And the bishop is not the bishop is longer on a pedestal. That's, that can continue. If that continues, guess what? My guess is the Catholic Church, as we know it today, will only last 50 years. 
Now, other churches have done something very similar. I know uh, I was raised Baptist myself, and I know uh, Baptist ministers are brought in, and they're actually pretty much vetted when they yes. come into a church a lot of times. Why, aren't the, why is that not done in the Catholic Church? It, it, because it's the whole authority system is just like the army. is a monarchical hierarchical society. So the dictates come. Even now, if somebody is going to be appointed bishop, say, in the diocese here of Venice in Florida, it's the bishop's conference or the congregation of bishops in Rome appoints him. And now they will do some uh, interviews with local priests to say, what would you think of so-and-so and so-and-so so coming? But if it's a bishop from, that, from another diocese, there's no consultation. It's just announced. We're going to have Archbishop uh, so-and-so from coming from Atlanta is going to come over and take here in Venice, or somebody in Patterson, New Jersey is going to come and be appointed here. And that's not, that's not keeping, following through on the dictates of, of what was intended by the Vatican II. Now, in your book, you also talk about the loss of priestly vocations as well as the loss of uh, people in the pews. How much does that concern you? Well, it is a concern, especially, um, I don't know if you caught 60 Minutes a couple of months ago, or maybe the last month it was, this, the bishop I talked to in Dublin, Archbishop Martin, he said that in the city of Dublin, where there used to be 98% attendance at Sunday Mass, now it's down to 2%. I actually cried almost when I heard that. I mean, if my mother, Lord Rester, or my dad, thought this was happening to the Catholic Church today, or my uncle, Father Michael, who gave, him, gave so much to the church, they're, they're turning in their graves at that. And it's not, I'm not blaming the bishops that are causing it. I know the modern times changes and people have become more secularized. But we need the church. We need the guidance of the church. We need the guidance of the priests. And I would hope that, that, that the lay people would join these reform groups in different countries and push for what I call Vatican Council III. They may not call it that, but I'm just calling that for now in, in the book. Could you read us a passage from your book that best reflects your hope for saving the Catholic Church? It's from chapter 27, the last chapter. What should we do, we do first to prepare for Vatican Council III? I believe we should start by holding synods in every country throughout the Catholic world. Just as the five popes did in reforming Catholicism in its heroic 11th century battles with kings for the freedom and the titanic struggles over lay investiture. The theologians of the world should conduct conferences to discuss the documents of the Second Vatican Council of the Senate, emphasizing to lay people their role and responsibility as reformers in the beloved church, but broken church. Bishops are invited, as, which we invite as part presenters at each of these synods, for the example of people like Bishop Liam McDade, who addressed his congregation on the day he was installed as Bishop Clark, saying, Jesus made no room in the church for privilege, earthly pomp or power, or lording over anyone. The only power to be highlighted would be the power of the cross of Christ. As St. Athanasius Alexandria said centuries ago, the power of the cross has filled the world. Finishing with the words of my beloved Pope, seize the opportunity and look far ahead. Pope John the Twenty-Third. Very inspiring words and very true today as well. Well, thank you again, Dr. Kaur. Remember, Broken Promises, Vatican Council II, will be at Barnes & Noble soon, so make sure you go out and get your copy, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much, Dale. And it will be available, hopefully, in a couple of months at Barnes & Noble, or at my website, or at Trafford Publishing. Thank you again. I appreciate your support.